So, well, now it's recording. That is weird. Okay, well, welcome to welcome to the class. It's half over. Talking about IVs. And we're getting into slide 43. No, 44, 5, 9. I might be getting flustered. All right. If you're just now tuning in, great, because I just got the recording to finally work. You're welcome. So we're going to talk about choosing an IV site. This can be a, a tricky little deal, obviously depending on a number of different factors. Ultimately, you want to select a vein and locate the vein selection within the straightest appearance. So when you're trying to find that vein, you're looking at the arm, you've got the tourniquet wrapped around the arm or leg and trying to find a vein that pops. You're looking for the straightest appearance. Choose a vein that has a firm, round appearance or is springy when you palpate. So as you push down on that vein, it should have some type of a spongy, springy, uh, not spongy, but more of a springy uh, bounce to it. If it doesn't spring back, if it's not uh, springy, you, it's probably not a vein. And when you puncture it, that patient might scream and yell. So don't do that. Avoid areas where the vein crosses over joints. Although we go for the AC, that's kind of across a joint, but yeah. But try to avoid those areas. So the picture here are some of the typical areas that we might go for the IV. And understanding, honestly, if you pay attention to the anatomy, if you look at different pictures of where veins are on a person or where they should be, it's going to ultimately help you find a location when you have a patient that maybe they're covered or the skin is darker so it's hard to see some of those veins or adipose tissue, people who are grossly overweight. So you're going to have those the ability to find those veins palpating and locate the areas where you can give a good puncture. Avoiding any extremity that shows signs of trauma, injury, infection, or edema, so swelling. Avoiding any extremity with dialysis fistula, which would be bad. Avoid any extremity on the same side as a prior mastectomy or lymph node dissection surgery. Also, try not to like signs of trauma, if you have a broken arm, broken leg, try not to use that, that appendage. Make sure that you're not using an appendage that is fake. <laughs> Would not be good either, especially when you're trying to get, uh, drill for an IO and you're not getting a flow. <laughs> uh, it, but it happens, unfortunately. It happens. Lymph node surgery, okay. For critical patients, always start at the antecubital fossa or higher. So up in the AC, you're starting up high for those critical patients. Just, just tear it open, Rusty. Jeez. So for, again, critical patients. We want to get that. It's the veins are going to be larger the higher up we go, and we want to be able to get again for critical patients. We need to get that larger catheter. Uh, we got to get that larger catheter just so we can get that higher flow. Connor, I see your remark. How critical is it to avoid mastectomy site? Well, the book says it's critical, so don't do it if you can. Anybody have any input on that? Yeah, right. 
Right. You have three, hopefully, you have three other appendages or two because you can still go to the legs or feet, ankles um, to, to try to gain access. Right. Rerouting of the vasculature. If you didn't hear that, Connor, Brusick added that if rerouting of, of some of that vascular vasculature based on that surgery uh, is potentially going to make it unpredictable of, of how your access is going to be, the flows. Choosing, continuing with choosing an IV site for critical, like I said, for critical, we want to start as, uh, as high up as possible, typically the AC. So right in the crease of the elbow. Start distally for other patients and work proximally. So you're going to start down at the hands or you're going to start down at the feet if you're going to do uh, the leg. Uh, start low and then work your way up. That way, if you happen to destroy a vein high, you can't go, typically you can't go any lower. If you've, if you've wrecked it up high, you're not going to be able to go lower. So start low and work your way back up. With wrist veins, you want to flex. Wrists and hands, you want, want to try to flex that wrist, pull the skin taunt over the knuckle, as in the picture here, to help make those veins pop out a little bit more. Also, to stabilize the vein and keep them kind of in line as you try to puncture it. Hold hand, hand veins in place there. I talked about that, stabilizing. Sometimes you might need to apply lateral traction uh, to the vein with your free hand to stabilize in the forearm or in the AC area, so pulling, pulling to the side. And use caution when cannulating leg veins, according to the book. Use caution. With the leg veins, I believe the the issue caution uh, is the potential of increased infection or blood clotting that could end up uh, causing a pulmonary embolus, vein thrombus. Different catheters, over the needle catheters and butterfly catheters are the most common. I think in the book there is a a bunch of pictures of the ones that we typically utilize here in the in the field but the hospital understand that the hospital or some of these care facilities urgent cares they're going to be using different types of catheters so you know if if you're at a facility and they're asking you to go ahead and get the the IV and they provide you with those catheters just understand they might have something a little bit different just take a look at it or make sure you just have your equipment so you can use your own your own IV catheter equipment. And the picture there is a, it's a, I think an auto retract or a, a safety needle on the top one there. And then the one in, in the lower is a butterfly catheter. Over the needle catheters are sized by the diameter referred to as the gauge. The lower the number, the bigger the needle, higher the number, the smaller the needle. They can be used for adults and most children for long-term IV care. The more distal the IV site, the smaller the catheter typically. So, and if you're going starting down low with the hand, you might only be able to get, say, a 22 in the hand. But up in the AC, you might be able to go and get a 16. Again, it's going to depend on your patient's History sometimes, their medical conditions, depending on what type of medications they're on for, for different things because it can affect their vasculature. No matter what the technique you use, keep the bevel side of the catheter up when inserting the needle in the vein. So again, with the catheters that we have, it's just a needle within that plastic. Once you... Uh, gain the gain access you just pull the metal out right 
Whereas on some of these other ones, like this one here in the top, there is a button that will retract that needle and it'll spring it back, which is a safety feature. But this catheter can be pulled off. The needle can be pulled out just the same as the ones that we use without actually hitting the button. So if you don't know how to retract it, just remove it the normal way that you, nor you remove the catheters we use them, the way we use them now. Oof, I'm struggling. So again, make sure the bevel side is up, always up. Maintain adequate traction in the vein during the cannulation. Because you're going to have pulling traction on that skin is going to help. Some skin is going to be more tough than others. You're going to, as you try to puncture that skin, that skin, maybe it's thick skin, truly thick skin in, in the arm even. And you try to puncture it. And as you try puncturing it, you're actually pushing the skin and not actually puncturing the skin. Or as you're, if you don't pull traction on the skin, that, again, that's going to help. If you pull traction, it's going to help stabilize that vein, you know, especially with those veins that roll. You're, you're going to have a harder time trying to uh, cannulate that vein with those rollers, and you might have to apply additional traction, again, from the side or, or whatever. So there's different, different ways of getting through some of that. Applying the constricting band, or we call them, as we call them tourniquets, you want to apply it above the site that you're going to, to start your IV at. It's going to help build up the pressure in that vein. It's going to help cause some back pressure to help pop that vein up so that you can see it better. And it's going to be able to be easier to push that needle into the, into the vein. Advance the catheter once you break through the skin into the vein. So you, as you go down, you're looking for that the uh, flash chamber. You're looking for blood to jump into that flash chamber. Once you get that blood jumping into that flash chamber, remember that's only the bevel basically that is up into that skin. So if you only have the bevel into the skin, you need to continue to push a few more millimeters in order to actually get the catheter into the vein. If you don't, it may not push. So you break through the skin, you get into the vein, you see the flash, now you need to drop that, that uh, needle down to about a 15 degree angle and advance it a few more millimeters and then advance the plastic catheter into the vein. When doing this, obviously we don't want to take BSI precautions, right? You want to make sure that you have your gloves on. You make sure you have your, your eye protection on. Uh, maybe even get a, a face mask depending on your patients. <laughs> Other things that you can use instead of the constricting band, and we use them. I, we had Justin, Justin Green used one yesterday. It was a blood pressure cuff to help. One person might be, they might already have the blood pressure cuff on one side because you've been doing a good patient assessment. So use the blood pressure cuff to help uh, use as a constricting band instead of just a regular tourniquet. Other things that we use for cleaning the site, again, we're trying to keep that as clean as possible, sterile as possible. We're going to use the alcohol preps. You might need to use uh, betadine. Uh, the hospital has chloropreps that they can use, you, or you might get those if you're at a facility and you're going to do it uh, IV there. And once you clean the site, don't touch it with your finger. Don't touch it with your hand. Try to the next thing that should be touching that site, once you clean it, should be the IV catheter, the IV needle. Uh, let's see, looking at notes here. Do not advance the needle too far because it can lacerate the back wall of the vein. Again, that's a, you might push all the way through the vein. It happens, especially if you're doing this during transport or if the patient decides to move their arm, stuff happens. So just be cautious about that. And once the catheter is fully advanced and you pull the needle out, make sure that you dispose of that sharps in the proper container or, I mean, according to the book, you're gonna dispose of it in the sharps container 
typically what do we do with that catheter though? Pass it off, put it on the counter so we can get, <laughs> get a blood sugar off of it maybe or whatever. So make sure ultimately that it needs to get into a sharps container, right? And once you pull that needle out of that catheter, if you do not hold pressure right above that uh, catheter on the arm, the actual arm, you're going to have blood coming out, right? You have now gained access, so you're going to have blood coming out. Sometimes you may not be able to hold pressure tight enough, and you're going to have blood trickling out anyways. But make sure you're trying to hold some pressure. So be prepared because you don't want to end up bloodletting this patient or contaminating your own clothes or, you know, as you're, you're moving around, you get blood dropping their blood on your skin because of whatever, positioning and whatever. So just be cautious of that. Blood drawing, we do blood draws. We are allowed to do blood draws here in this county. Blood draws are done if you're going to do it. You're going to do it before you push fluids, before you push medications. We have a system of how it's done here. There's two blues, two greens, and a purple. The first blue is drawn and disposed of. The second blue, then two greens, and then a purple, and it has to be done in that order. And there's different ways of doing that successfully. There's different, a couple different methods of drawing blood with our, our sets. So whoever you work with, just work with them on, on different ways if you decide you want to draw, draw labs in the field. Do you still do that? I do. Regularly? Yes. Some guys don't like doing it because it takes time. Um, it is a pain. In, it can be a pain in the butt. We have to make sure if you do draw labs, you have to make sure that you label the the tubes individually properly. It has to have the patient's name, date of birth, time, date, your initials. It has to be clearly labeled. Uh, with our label makers, it's it's possible to do it. It just it can be a pain in the butt. Uh, the hospital has labels that you can use if it's allowed, whoever's listening. Um, and with that, then it's because it already has the patient's information on it. And you put your initials, EMT, and the time you drew it. And those are accepted. And there is an importance of drawing labs in the field. When, you're, when you have a, a cardiac patient and, or a, a possible stroke patient or a possible septic patient, getting those, uh, those labs drawn early can also then be compared to later on with labs drawn later in the hospital. Any questions on labs? Besides just drawing them straight into the tubes, another way of doing it is actually drawing it into a 10, 15, or 20 cc syringe and then injecting those into each individual tube. That's an, a way of doing it. And again, ultimately you're following protocol, which I don't think we officially have anything written down for protocols for labs. Secure the line. Once you have the IV access, you need to secure it. You need to secure it in place properly. You need to put the tagoderm, the clear tape that is protecting the actual location the catheter enters the skin. You need to keep that clean. So you have the tagoderm that you place over that site, and then you need to make sure that you're using enough tape to secure that drip set or that extension set to the hand, arm, whatever appendage you put that onto. There's different ways of doing that, but ultimately it's to help in case there's a snag, it doesn't actually pull the catheter out of the vein. Avoid any circumferential uh, taping around the extremity. Now we do have those patients where sometimes you have to, because they're so diaphoretic, you might have to go completely around an arm with some tape in order to keep that, that line secured. Uh, 
So it, it does happen in the field, but you want to try to avoid any circumferential taping around the extremity. The other thing that is to consider is, say you have a patient who is a little cuckoo cachoo, who is not acting right, a little altered, or even pediatrics. You might want to secure that line a little bit above and beyond tape. You might want to secure it with, say, a, a rolled gauze just to help keep that in place so that they don't just go and start pulling at it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Changing the IV fluids. So if you are able to get a full bag of fluid into a patient for whatever reason, maybe we have a long transport, maybe you have a large catheter IV and you're able to get a full liter of fluid in a 15 minute transport before you get to the hospital. You want to try to stop the flow of the fluid before it depletes out of the bag. Now, I've seen multiple bags go all the way to where it stops dripping and the nurses aren't even changing them and they're just hanging there for, for quite a while. It happens in the ambulance, especially when things are kind of crazy and it's a busy scene. That fluid can deplete completely out of that bag. Typically, there's still some fluid, though, in that drip chamber. Make sure you prepare and inspect the new bag before you spike it. Make sure it's the right date. It's not expired. Make sure the clarity is good. Make sure it's the right IV solution. Remove the piercing spike from the depleted bag, insert it into the new port in the new bag, and ensure the drip chamber is appropriately filled. So you want to make sure that drip chamber still has some fluid in it. Uh, use the roller clamp to adjust the fluid rate accordingly. Discontinuing the IV line is a matter of just shutting off the line. You use the roller to clamp it, clamp the line shut. Stabilize the catheter. You need to pull all the tape. And when you pull tape off that patient's uh, arm, hand, leg, foot, ankle, EJ, whatever, make sure that you are holding the catheter in place so as you pull the tape, the tegaderm, you don't just pull that IV catheter out and all of a sudden blood and things come flinging around. I've seen that happen by accident and it can get messy. You wanna stabilize the catheter while you loosen all the tape, gently pull the catheter and the IV line. Also, if you're DCing a, a IV in the field or at a hospital or wherever, explain it to the patient what, what you're doing. Again, try to explain to them that, hey, yeah, tape, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna pull a little hair. As they, because as you pull hair, they might flinch and they might move their arm and all of a sudden now that line is flinging out and they're actively bleeding. The other thing is when you pull that line out and you actually have a hold of it, let them know that the site where you're pulling that out of might burn it. You might, they might get like a little burning sensation as you pull that IV line out. I, I don't understand exactly why that happens, but there's a, a little burning sensation that some people actually feel when you pull that line out. We typically use a four by four, fold it over a few times in order to hold down pressure to stop that bleeding once that line is pulled out. Hold pressure for a moment, have the patient hold the pressure, and then tape up that site. Need to get that, Coulter? <laughs> Alternative IV sites and techniques. Saline locks, we, typically, we use saline locks here in the field. The benefit of making sure a saline lock is at the bottom of a drip set is that it is going to be easy for the hospital or the next provider to change out that drip set later if they have to. It also helps sometimes if you're trying to get that, well, for the hospital, when they're trying to get that patient into a gown. They can just DC that drip set from the hub of the extension set. Now all they have is this small line that they don't have to fiddle fart with on some of our patient's clothing.
That's the end of the hip. All right. So the extension sets hold about two milliliters of fluid. That's actually an important deal when you're pushing, when we only use a extension set in a patient instead of hanging a bag of fluid is once you push medicine through this line, remember it's still, it's holding about two milliliters of fluid. So if I'm pu only pushing one milliliter of medication, it's not actually getting into the vein unless I flush it with a, a saline flush. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Okay. EJs. EJs provide venous access through the external jugular vein of the neck. It is amazing. The best way to do this that I found is that you have the patient kind of at an incline like this you see in the picture here. You turn the, the head to the side. You're going to place some pressure at the kind of the base of the, the neck there where the vein comes down just above the, the collarbone to help occlude that vein to cr help create some back pressure. You're going to cleanse the site and it's typically between the collarbone and the corner of the jaw. You're going to cleanse that site. Again, the next thing once you cleanse that site is the only thing that should be touching that is should be that, that needle. And you're going to go from the head down towards the chest. Make sure you don't go from chest up towards the head would be bad. You go down. And again, this the actual puncture site on that EJ should be about midway between the angle of the jaw and that collarbone. Now, EJs, <laughs> I've had two or three EJs. And I love, it's, it's just a big, massive vein. Now, the skin acts a little bit differently in the neck than it does in the arm. It's a little bit more tough, but it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It is in the state EMS protocols to allow advanced EMTs, but it is not in our local protocol. I know, right? It's kind of a bummer. So sorry. Is EJ, there you go. I know, I know. Sorry, Andy. So yeah, so it's, it's on the state protocol, but it's not in our local protocol. Maybe one of these days. This, for an EJ, it's a 16 gauge or even a 14 gauge is, <laughs> I've done the 16s on the neck. I haven't, I've actually only ever pushed one 14 gauge and that was when I was doing clinicals down in Texas and that was like pushing pencil lead through a person's arm. It seemed just barbaric, but it's weird. Troubleshooting IV therapy. So when you're pushing, again, when you're pushing fluids, we need to make sure that, one, you know what you're pushing, how you're pushing it, why you're pushing it, is it the right person? You know, you go through those 10 rights, but you also need to make sure that you understand what you're looking for. What's the process, what's the end goal to push these fluids? And then once you identify all this, make sure you understand, of course, knowing your equipment, you understand how it's supposed to work. So when something is not working right, you can troubleshoot it, fix it, and make it better. So understand the different fluids. Understand your different administration sets. So you have an administration set. Somebody spiked it for you because you allowed somebody else to prepare your equipment, and you're just not getting the flow that you want. And then you look to double check at that drip chamber and you notice that that drip chamber is a micro drip instead of a macro drip. So it's again, it's that 60 drops per milliliter versus 15 drops per milliliter. That might be your issue. The height of your bag might be an issue. Maybe having that IV bag kind of low uh, next to that patient is not allowing enough pressure. It's, it works kind of like on a gravity feed, right? So you might need to uh, raise up that IV bag as high as you can. You're on scene. Uh, maybe you need to give that, have somebody hold the IV bag for you and raise it up as high as they can so that it gets good flow. Or maybe they need to 
add a blood pressure cuff or, or give it a little squeeze in order to get a good flow. Maybe the catheter that you used isn't the right size catheter. Or maybe you have an issue with the vein. Maybe ultimately you forgot to remove the tourniquet. And that's why you're not getting your flow. So understand you need to figure out how to troubleshoot when things are not working right. Some different complications. So infiltration. Infiltration is a frustrating thing. It's when the fluid basically escapes into the surrounding tissue for whatever reason. You've passed the IV all the way through the vein. Um, you've sheared the vein because the, the vein basically just opens up as you as because it's they are poor veins. As soon as the needle hits it, it opens wide open, and you're now pushing fluid as well as blood into that surrounding tissue. Or other issues is maybe the catheter wasn't started at, uh, let's see, catheter was started at too shallow of an angle and it was only entered the fascia surrounding the vein. So it actually hasn't gone into the vein. Remember, once you push that bevel and get that flash, you need to advance it, drop it down, and then advance it a couple more millimeters in order to get the catheter actually into that vein. Infiltration, some of the different signs, you're going to see edema at the catheter site. So some swelling, you're going to get like that bulge as you push that fluid, you're going to get a bulge just above where the catheter is entered the skin. Uh, continued IV flow after occlusion of the vein above the insertion site. Tightness and pain around the IV site. So you might, they might actually have pain as as a result of the infiltration. The other, th other issue that can cause infiltration also is if you have a patient that is moving too much, you've got, and you're just unable to get a, an adequate taping job or whatever. Maybe I had one from a patient who was in a big rig and I had tape on it and everything. I was able to get almost 800 cc's of fluid in and getting ready to push some medication. And he was moving his arm around because it was a long scenario or, or a long situation. And as I was getting ready, because he was moving around, I was going to go put some uh, rolled gauze around the arm. And when I went to do that, I noticed that he started getting that bulge in the skin. And I still have flow in my drip chamber but now I'm seeing a bulge in the skin. And so that fluid is now not in the vein, but it's outside of the vein into the, in, into the surrounding tissue. So with that, you have to stop the, you have to stop your flow. Thrombophlebitis, inflammation of the vein, which is an issue. And we typically are not going to see it in the pre-hospital setting, but some of the symptoms are going to be fever, tenderness, red streaking of the vein, associated vein. So you're going to, the vein above where that IV catheter is in place, you might see some red streaking in that vein, of, in the skin through that, through the skin of that vein. Common causes included local irritation, infection, prolonged IV therapy. So where we might see it is if we're picking somebody up from, say, a care home or they have in-home health care and they have continued IV therapy, say, at their, at their house or in a pre-hospital setting. Or it could also be caused by too rapid of an infusion. So it's just too, pushing fluids in too fast. Occlusions are another complication. So it's a blockage of the vein or the catheter. And typically you might see this when you've stopped flow or you have that rate of TKO to keep vein open. If you don't, if you actually completely stop your flow and you're moving this patient, say you have to go over a distance, 
you might be moving this patient and you have just the fluids laid down on their lap or, or you're carrying them, but you're just not flowing the fluid. They might get a backup of blood into the line. And once you reopen that line, that might be enough blood there that is actually preventing the flow. It might have kind of stopped that flow of the fluid. So you might actually have to give a, pr a pressure on that bag or use a flush to help uh, free up that occlusion. You're going to see a decreased drip rate or the presence of blood in the IV tubing. That's your first sign. And again, some of the causes, positional IV site, proximal to the valve, patient movement, IV bags, emptied. You need to obviously determine, based on your, your issue, whether there's infiltration, occlusion, you need to determine whether you need, you're going to be able to continue with that location or do you need to establish a second location. DC this one and do another line. Uh, maybe, and so I guess with this, what this is referring to as well is like what I've already talked about. Maybe you just have to flush the line in order to gain your, your establishment of that existing IV site. <laughs> Hematoma. We've, <laughs> I'm sure we've all seen a patient with hematoma. You see this with patients who take blood thinners who have fallen who have uh, regular IVs or blood draws, you're gonna see this redness and potential swelling in the hands and arms where IV sites uh, typically go. So the accumulation of blood in the tissue surrounding the IV site, we could cause that hematoma if we infiltrate that, that IV. So if you go all the way through that, IV, uh, that vein with a needle, go through the other side, you potentially are going to cause a hematoma. Or if you puncture that vein and that vein splits open on you, you're going to get bleeding into the tissues surrounding the IV site, and this is what you're going to see. Well, it's going to be more of a darker purple, but it's going to end up turning more of this reddish, reddish purple over time. If you have this, if you get this uh, hematoma, you notice a hematoma as you're doing your blood, your IV, obviously you need to stop. You need to hold pressure, pull the IV catheter out, continue to hold pressure, and secure that bandage, that 4x4, four four, whatever you use, with some tape. Uh, with some of these patients, because they're on blood thinners, they're going to bleed a little bit extra. And it would be nice... It is a nice thing if you have the opportunity to hold pressure on that spot for an extra few minutes just to relieve them of that, that pain that they're going to have later on from that blood buildup and clotting underneath the skin. Again, if you don't palpate the vein and notice that it is the site that you're going for is springy, you might actually be puncturing a nerve or I mean a, a tendon or a ligament, which is going to, it, it, it's going to cause a lot of pain and it could cause some serious damage in that patient. Sometimes you have different nerve bundles in areas and they might, you might hit a nerve bundle when you hit that vein or when you're trying to get that vein, that patient is going to be in a little bit more pain. I know my father-in-law, he, when you, he preferred, the best sight on him was his hand. The hand is a tender spot. But as soon as you hit the, the skin with his hand, for whatever reason, his nerves in that hand, man, if, you didn't, if he didn't get it numbed, like say at the hospital, you would swear you were cutting his hand off because he was screaming as soon as, because it, for him, keep in mind, everybody's built a little bit differently, right? I, I prefer a hand and yeah, it hurts, but I'm not, I'll be able to just leave the hand there. But some patients it hits and they ha are maybe more sensitive to the pain. They might scream a little bit. So just be aware that sometimes you might be hitting into nerves. I had one, one time when I was in a sacred heart where it was, they had the IV into the, uh, inner AC section here, that medial section. 
And for whatever reason, it, that it hurt. I mean, every time it was in there, but every time like I moved a finger or, or my hand, I could actually feel a sharp stabbing pain up here in where that IV site was at. And it was because of some nerves in that, that specific area. If your patient is complaining of pain because of the IV, stop the IV. Go to a different site, remove the IV, and yeah, remove the IV. So again, your symptoms are going to include that sudden severe shooting pain. They might get numbness in the extremity, which would, would, would be bad. The other issue you might have is if you give an arterial puncture. So if you're palpating that vein and it's that spongy, well, it's, it's springy, but if you don't really notice that there's also a pulse with that, as soon as you cannulate that vein and hook up, your, you're going to be struggling trying to hold pressure, and it's going to be trying to spurt out. And as soon as you hook up your drip set, you're going to get a, a, a blast of blood basically up that drip line. And it's th that arterial puncture with an IV will actually backfill through your drip line and up into your bag if you don't pay attention. I've seen that in the field. And it's with that, I've actually seen it a couple times. If this happens, according to the book, obviously you need to stop it, remove, hold pressure, and remove that the catheter. Now, Something to consider real world. Do you have time to hold pressure for five minutes on that artery when you pull that needle? Or would you rather just stop it, clip it off, tape it off, get your IV in another arm or another appendage, and then come back and deal with that later? So think about that. So real world, don't you if you get an artery, leave it. Leave it and deal with it later when you have a better opportunity to deal with it. But ultimately you need to stop that. Uh, make sure you try a different site. Don't try to push anything into that, that artery. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. So other thing with an artery, you're gonna notice it's gonna be bright red, obviously. It's gonna continue to spurt and it's going to uh, again, travel up into that drip through that drip line, that macro drip set or micro drip set. It's going to travel up that line relatively quickly. And any vein. So the other thing with this, actually, according to the book, or the artery. If you puncture an artery as you're trying to do an IV, according to the book, you need to hold pressure for about 15 minutes. So that's again, that's why it's probably best just to close it off, go to a different site, tape it off, secure it, and go try to do a different site and then go back to that to DC it when you have 15 minutes to hold pressure. So other complications, you might have systemic complications as a result of your IV, can result from reactions because of the IV site. They might have an allergic reaction. Offer minor, often minor, but anaphylaxis is possible. And related to an individual's unexpected sensitivity, or it can be related to the individual's un unexpected sensitivity to medication. And something like this needs to be treated aggressively. We treat this with Benadryl, or if they have breathing difficulty, you know, treat it with some Epi. Stop the IV. You make sure you uh, stop the IV. Uh, common signs and symptoms. We all know what common signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis are. You're going to possibly get your urticaria. You might get some uh, itching skin. They might have some breathing difficulty. And they're going to be maybe some pain in that that location. Uh, shortness of breath, edema of the face, potentially in the hands, bronchospasms, wheezing. So again, we want to DC this IV administration and remove the, remove the solution. Continue to monitor the ABCs of the patient with this. 
because we hopefully once we remove the issue and we try to treat that aggressively, we continue to fix the issue. We want to make sure we're making positive changes. Again, we're trying to do no harm. Air embolus is when you get air bubbles that blocks blood flow. So I see this more with the drip set. When you're connecting the drip set, there is a, a bit of a technique to hook up a drip set to an IV bag to help push all that fluid out. So you're not just running fluid to try to drip all those air bubbles out. When you open up your packaging of your, your micro or macro drip set, the roller is in the open position. So close it. Remove the plastic sheath over the plastic spiky thing. And when you puncture the bag, once you puncture the bag, give a little squish squash of the uh, drip chamber. So it fills it up about halfway. And then open up the roller. Now you have fluid already in the drip chamber. And when you open up that roller, it's going to continue to fill as that drip chamber lowers into the tubing, it's going to pull fluids from the bag, right? And it's going to push all that air right on out. Whereas if you leave the roller open, spike the bag, and then fill the drip chamber, you're going to have a whole bunch of bubbles in that drip line, and you're going to be sitting there trying to, trying to get those bubbles out. And you're just going to be flowing fluids, and there's still going to be bubbles in the line. So... Make sure you flush the line properly. Sometimes patients look at those bubbles and they, because they see, oh, bubbles in the air in the in the line are are bad, and they see the bubbles, even if it's a couple little bubbles, which are not going to hurt the patient. It's not going not in nearly enough to hurt the patient, but they see a couple little bubbles and their eyes get about yay big, uh, because all they heard about in on some TV show is there's air in the line that's going to kill you. So cautious with that. Signs and symptoms of an air embolus could uh, be cyanosis. So the patient's going to become cyanotic. They might have a respiratory difficulty or a respiratory arrest, a loss of consciousness, sudden chest pain, signs and symptoms of shock. Ultimately, with that, anything, any of these issues... Documentation is going to be key. Catheter shear is another complication, and it occurs when you fiddle fart with the catheter and the needle. And it can happen when you puncture the vein, and I think I'm in, I got maybe got a little flash, but I'm not sure, and I tried to ad advance the catheter past the tip of the bezel of the needle and nope nope that's definitely that's not it so you pull it back and you pull that catheter back onto the needle well what can happen is that catheter as you pull that back can get caught from the sharp point of the needle and it can shear a section of that into that catheter off puncturing that catheter you can shear it and cause a piece of that plastic to go through the vein, it would be bad. That's also going to cause some serious complications. It's a free-floating agent that's in the blood that ultimately could get to uh, the heart, the brain, the lungs, could result in myocardial infarction, some stroke, or other, other respiratory issues. The good thing is that plastic can be seen by uh, x-ray. So if that were to happen, they're going to be able to locate where that is with an x-ray. That's if they don't die before they get there. You got that going for you. So treatments involve surgical removal of that sheer tip. Uh, they, uh, so other, other things, patient might suddenly uh, have some dyspnea, shortness of breath because of a pulmonary 
artery occlusion. Um, and to, if this were to happen, you need to do the same thing as with the air, air embolus, excuse me, is you need to DC this line, possibly try a new, new location, and then make sure you document. Circulatory overload is when you push too much fluid into the patient. And this is going to happen in, in a chaotic scene or if you use the wrong drip set. As an example, with pediatrics, we should be using, and infants, we should be using micro drip sets instead of macro drip sets so that it's a better control of fluid. It's going to happen if the IV line is, let's see, Common cause of failure to is to adjust drip rates after flushing. So yeah, so if you don't adjust your drip rate after flowing or establishing your IV, you don't do a TKO, or if you forget that it's wide open and you have a free-flowing solution going through that drip, drip chamber and you don't pay attention that you need to just slow that down. All of a sudden now your bag is empty and potential of fluid overload is going to cause dyspnea you're going to see possible jugular vein distension. So again, when you kind of have that patient at a 45 degree angle, turn your head to the side, you're going to see some veins standing on the, in the neck. And you can see an increase in blood pressure. With this, you need to slow your IV rates. Make sure that the, uh, you raise the patient's head to ease on respiratory distress. Because again, if it's a fluid overload, you might have overloaded the system. Now that fluid's got to go somewhere. You might, it might be backing up into the lungs. So that's might causing respiratory distress. And what, how do we position our patients with respiratory distress, right? We want to sit them up. So same, same way of fixing this, sit them up so that they can breathe a little bit easier. Make sure you're giving them high flow oxygen and then continue to monitor their vital signs. Some of that with the respiratory, you might notice that, well, they had clear lung sounds to begin with, to, to begin with and now they have some crackles. They got that fluid, fluid buildup. So you might actually be able to hear that as a sign, symptom, sign, when you hear it, sign of the symptom. Okay. Uh, Vasovagal reaction. So this is awesome. How many patients say, oh, I don't like IVs. I don't, I, it makes me, I get, I get, I, it makes, I feel like I'm going to pass out. Well, good, good thing is most of the time when we're doing our, our IVs, patients are already laying down. They can't fall no further. So reassure them that you got them. They're going to be okay because they're going to have some anxiety. They might have anxiety concerning the needle. They might have con anxiety concerning the blood. They don't like the sight of blood. It makes me, makes me queasy. Anxiety could cause diaphoresis, could cause nausea, could cause a syncopal episode. So all of a sudden, <laughs> as you're looking at this patient, they go from pink to pale. All of a sudden, the color in the lips is gone and their, their face is a little bit more pale. So to treat this, place this patient into a shock management situation, lay them flat. If they're sitting up, lay them flat. Keep them warm, reassure them that it's going to be okay. The other the, a positive of this, and I've seen this a few times with rapid heart rates that we are trying to convert, is a, it's a vasovagal response. So when we try to get like that SVT and we try to get them to bear down and try to get, initiate that vasovagal response, I've seen three conversions in the field because of an IV start based on that vasovagal response the patient had. And then the medic is like, crap, I can't push medications now because they've already, they've already converted. But it is a po possibility that when you do start an IV that you can actually convert an SVT. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. Like I said, I've seen it three times since I've been here. Um, 
All right. Any questions on complications, treatments, fixing those? About infiltration. Uh huh. How much is like when does it become dangerous? If you don't pay attention. Sure. But, but like with if you get a little fluid. It's not going to be. It's it's, it's going to absorb. And you're going to be fine. It's going to be just fine. Because when we administer medications, we still can administer medications subcutaneously, right? So kind of in that in that same space, right? Yeah. So it's it'll be fine. Sure. Um, any other questions online? Andy, Ryan, Taylor. John, anybody? Okay. You guys are beautiful. All right. So let us, you guys want to take another break or go a few, a few more minutes? We got some pediatrics, IO, and then get into some mathematics. Take a break? All right, we'll take a break. We'll take a break. Final. All right. How's everybody doing? Great, Dandy. All right. Pediatric IV therapy considerations. So here is actually a picture of. They actually have a picture basically of the needles that we use, right? And these are pretty similar to the needles that we use in the field. Um, as at least the colors are consistent with what we use. It's kind of a universal. 24 being the smallest that we use in the field, but some pediatrics, some hospitals, the neonate facilities, they actually can go, they have go down to like 26 gauge, I believe. And I, I know those 24 gauge are super tiny already. And to think that the 26 is another size. Various sizes, typically for us, again, we have the 24 through the 14 gauge. With pediatrics, butterfly catheters are ideal. We don't get those in the field. And with the little, little bitty one uh, patients, scalp veins are the best to utilize. Hand veins are painful, but remain a location of choice for a lot of peripheral IV starts for pediatrics. Protecting the IV site after it has been established is critical with these. Like I said, extra tape maybe, or even wrapping a um, elastic gauze, uh, the rolled gauze around the loosely, make sure it's loose around the IV after it's been taped would be good. So it helps prevent them from having access to pull those lines. Using a pin light, if you're going to start an IV in the hands, using a pin light on the opposite side can help illuminate some of those veins on the back of the hand or a, a pocket flashlight or whatever to help illuminate. I've only had a couple pediatric starts, and those that's the one part about pediatrics I don't like doing, as well as obviously thinking about trying to innovate a pediatric, but doing IVs on kids because they're already having a bet. I mean, they're angry and they don't understand the, I mean, I watch my kids get IVs or, you know, needles in the, in the doctor's office and they scream as soon as that needle comes out. So kids know that it's going to be difficult. And so you need to take extra, extra care in trying to explain to family sometimes you know, some sometimes family has that that parental protective instinct, and they like if I see somebody causing my kid to scream, I get angry at that person. So maybe having, you know, you gotta gauge your scene, right? Ga gauge your fa the family. Sometimes keeping them there might help calm the child, maybe help 
hold the child's arm or hold them down to get that IV. Or depending on the, that parent, you might have to have them removed. Ask them to go into another room until you get that IV started. Be careful when using macro drips. Again, we want to use micro drips because it's easier to control the flow and easier to monitor uh, how much fluid you're going to give. With kids, by protocol, 20 cc's per kilogram, it's weight-based, is what we're going to give for, for pediatrics. Mm, see what else. Fluid, fluid overloading, when you, if you use, end up, even if you use a micro drip set, be cautious of flu, fluid overloading because it can be very serious with pediatrics and even geriatric patients. So again, make sure you're monitoring your administrations uh, closely. Geriatric IV therapy considerations can be tough. It can be very tough. You see, see all kinds of different uh, veins, what they look like with different patients. Make sure you don't utilize varicose veins. Varicose veins are not, you, you shouldn't be using those because they're not going to allow good flow. The veins may be, may be stiff and hard. They, they have that sclerosis. They could be spidery, wiry, wiry. They could be small, weave back and forth. And you've seen those veins where they just like look like a twisty, windy road. So those can be very difficult. And again, because of with geriatrics, right, is because of the different medications, uh, the veins could be either hard or they could be very, very. Uh, ugh. As soon as you hit it, it opens up. They can be very thin, it can be very fragile. Those veins can be fragile. Okay, any questions on geriatric, pediatric considerations? Good. Technique of administering fluids with an IO. So you gotta understand your, your locations with the IOs. We have a couple different locations that we can go with in the field. Typically, what we're going to go with is going to be the tibia, right? So in the upper portion of the tibia. So you got to understand your, your workup, the, the anatomy of that bone. Understand what part of the bone you're actually going to go to uh, for pushing the, the needle through. Understand how deep you're going to push that needle. Are you going into the proximal tibia or the distal tibia? So it's, is it in the upper part of the shin or just, uh, just above the ankle bone? We don't do sternums here in the, locally, but we potentially we can have that opportunity to do a humeral. So the picture here is actually a humeral bone. That's a humerus. So you have the ep Epiphysis, which is that top section, the diaphysis, diaphysis, which is that middle section, and the metaphys is what meets those two, the diaphys diaphysis and epiphysis. Oof, tough words. The other issue that you need to understand is, especially with pediatrics, is if you don't go in the right location and you puncture the growth plate, which is typically where the top of that and the shaft meet, you could actually damage that kid and prevent, cause long-term damage for that pediatric. Long bones consist of the shaft, the ends, and the growth plate. IO space comprises of the spongy uh, bone, right, the marrow, and it is considered a non-collapsible vein. Typically, anything that you can push IO, or I mean IV, can go IO, although I, I just can't picture pushing D50 IO, right? 
Uh, again, we don't use the sternum, but it is a location that has been used. The humerus, the proximal, proximal tibia, and the distal tibia are common sites. So again, the proximal tibia is going to be just below that tibial tuberosity, so that prominent piece of bone as, you're, as, they're, as they're laying there. Top of that bone, right below the kneecap. So you have that tibial tuberosity, and you go two to three centimeters directly below that. And that is going to be your location for that proximal tibia. The distal tibia is going to be the inner ankle bone. And you're going to go up about two to three centimeters above, directly above that uh, inner ankle bone. And the humeral site is going to be humeral head, just on the outside of that humeral head below that two centimeters below the top top section you have to yeah I haven't done that one yet I had an opportunity and I wasn't confident so I didn't take it sternal IO if we ever get one of these this is typically used in military and even some tactical environments for SWAT teams but sternal IO is going to be in the top portion of the sternum just below the sternal notch. And this is a location that should not interfere with CPR should this patient need to have CPR. Uh, tibial sites, we just talked about that. So there's a picture of the tibial. And it's kind of a flat portion of that bone. If you kind of towards the inside, it's kind of that flat portion. Here's the ankle, again, the inner ankle, and two to three centimeters above the inner ankle. Different options for equipment. We have the Easy IO here locally, um, but I know in some training environments they use the manual IO with like the needle that is shown there, the blue one. Solid bore needle and insert it through a sharpened hollow needle and you do a twisting. No? No, you don't, you don't want to try that? So once you push that in, then you remove the actual needle inside and you are left with a hollow metal catheter that you can connect to. Fast device. Here's a FAST device, so understand the FAST device. We don't have that locally. FAST1, again, we're not using this, but this is something that, <laughs> there's some awesome YouTube videos of military utilizing this. They use it in training, and they use it on a conscious and alert patient. Uh, it actually has a clicking once it is inserted appropriately. It has, it will click, and you know it's in the, it's in the right. Basically, it's in far enough. Uh, there's a video out there where a guy is pushing down on this fast on a guy's sternum, and it's kind of it's going, and it's those needles are breaking through the skin, and it's not really clicking, and he's he's just not pushing hard enough, and the guy's just laying there. Oh, as I hit the mic, sorry. So the guy's just laying there, and it's, it looks miserable. It looks miserable until the, until the other guy comes in. No, just push. Right. Uh, easy I.O., that's what we have. It's got a built-in. It's a solid uh, little handgun driver thing. It's got batteries already inside. It's something that we are not allowed to replace the batteries with. Once the machine is dead we replace it actually bef hopefully before it's actually dead once you realize it's it's losing power you should replace these it's handheld utilizes we have three different size needles that we insert on the end it's a pink blue and a yellow pink is for the pediatrics a little short needle the blue is for a normal adult and the yellow is going to have a long needle which is going to be for more for the 
larger obese when you have a lot of adipose tissue that you have to get through to, before you actually even get to the bone. You need to push these in until you get, uh, I think you still have, there's a black line you have to see where that's at on those needles. Can be used in the tibia on adults and children, but only in the humeral head in adults. Again, you want to, the caution piece here is if you go in the wrong, with a kid, they still have the growth plate. They're still trying to grow, right? And if you damage that growth plate in the humerus, you're going to cause permanent damage. Bone injection gun or the big is awesome. Spring-loaded device that is used in the proximal tib, proximal tib of adults and pediatric patients. It utilizes a safety lock as a stabilization, a stabilization device. So it's something that potentially we could end up with in the future. Um, it's, I believe it's actually cheaper than, it's a lot cheaper than the EZIO. EZIO is like several hundreds of dollars where these are probably a hundred dollars. So whatever that's worth. And then it's manually, it's manually instead of like the EZIO is a battery operated. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened? Okay. Then there's also the new intraosseous intra device, the Neo, Nio, spring loaded device. I uh, believe I saw this at the, a device like this back in Charlotte this last year at the GEMS convention. And they're trying to, trying to, a couple companies are trying to push this. Placed in the proximal tibia of an adult patient, humeral head is an alternative site, and it's inserted by unlocking a safety cap. So it's basically, it's another device that offers some safety to, for us. Fast device, just understand that for a fast device, you align the adhesive on the target of the patient, and it goes in the manubrium, which is that top portion of the sternum. Fast one, same thing, basically. Once you have your IO attached or into the uh, inserted, you need to insert the lure lock onto the metal or onto your, your IO. Aspirate the blood and particles of the bone marrow to ensure proper placement. So you can, once you have your Lure lock established, you can pull back with a syringe to try to aspirate to make sure you have some blood and bone marrow. And then once you notice that, then you just slowly inject the IV solution to ensure proper placement of the needle. Cautions, obviously, is making sure that you didn't fracture a bone, different, bone, different um, medical conditions can cause issues for you with the because. Medical issues with the patient can cause issues for you. Um, make sure you didn't <laughs> you didn't use the wrong needle, and you went all the way through the bone, wrong placement, wrong location of the bone. You need to make sure you just pay attention. Know your anatomy, know your equipment, and follow the ten rights. If you do this in a conscious patient, expect the patient to be in pain when you first push this. And I guess I, I've mentioned before, so this is in a way, picture a brain freeze, but now it's in the middle of your bone. So that's kind of what you're, cause, you're doing to this patient, right? So something to think about. Uh, yeah. Okay. Extravasation occurs when IO needle does not rest in the IO space. So that's when it's not in the right spot, right? And it doesn't, you're going to notice this because it's not running freely or if the site becomes swollen and you notice infiltration basically. The area around it is starting to gather fluid. Osteomyelitis is an inflammation of the bone and muscle caused by an infection. So that can be an issue. Uh, 
Undetected extravasation could result in compartment syndrome, which would also be bad for that patient. Could be, could be a bad thing. Okay. Through and through insertion, I mentioned that. So it goes through both sides and suspect a pulmonary embolism if the patient experiences acute shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, and cyanosis. So those are the signs. Again, remember, anytime we do a treatment, anytime we provide an intervention, we need to be looking for a result of something, either an improvement or negative signs and symptoms that things are getting worse. Contraindications of an IO, fracture of a bone that you're intended to, so a leg fracture, which would be a bad idea to try to do an IO. Osteoporosis, if you know that patient's got osteoporosis. Osteogenesis imperfecta, that's going to be where the bones are, it's that where the bones are kind of like glass, so the movie Glass, the guy who, when you when you falls, and it doesn't take much trauma to those for those bones to actually break. So actually, if you know of a patient that has that, you do not, you, you truly do not want to do an IO in that patient's bone because you could actually fracture the bone as you try to push that. How about now? You can probably hear everybody. Yeah. So, sorry, the microphone battery died, so we'll have to go off the Hubble. Hubble. So, for everybody here in the room, everybody can hear you through that mic. Anything you say can be heard now. Just, you know, it's appropriateness. I'm never incorporate. All times. Okay. Thank you. All right, decimals, metrics, percentages. They're all amazing. Uh, decimal basis upon multiples of 10. We use meters, liters, and grams. Meters for unit of length, liters is unit of volume, and grams for unit of weight. Of course, we're, this is the metric system. The rest of the world uses metric system. Everything in the medical field typically is, is metric system, so that's why we're going off of metric system. Commonly used prefixes from smallest to largest, micro, milli, centi, and kilo. Volume conversions, one liter equals a thousand milliliters. 
weight conversions, grams to milligrams, and milligrams to grams. There you go. Any questions? Perfect. Converting pounds to kilograms. So this is where this is actually important because, again, most of our patients, when we ask them how much they weigh, they're going to tell us in pounds. We have to actually convert that over to kilograms because when we use weight-based medications, we got to know the kilograms. So the simple way of doing this is either dividing the patient's weight by 2.2 or a simple way of just subtracting, dividing by 2 and then subtracting 10%. So a patient who weighs 220 pounds is 100 kilos. Because if I take away, so I divide 220 by 2 is going to be 110. 10% 10 is 11, right? So technically 99, so we can use 100. So there you go. So simple math, large adults, no, normal adult men, 220 pounds, adult females, petite adult females, 110. 110 makes them 50 kilos. Right? So 110. So 110 divided by 2 is 55 kilos minus the 10% is 5. Makes sense? Okay. So 2 o'clock in the morning math. Divide by 2, subtract 10%. Dimensional analysis is the easiest way to calculate drip rates. So it allows us to compare unrelated items and use them in ratios to con as conversion factors. So again, this is where it's taking, I'm going to do so many kilos, the, the milligrams or the, the amount we're going to give is based off of kilograms. So I'm going to give them so many milligrams versus uh, per their kilograms to give them a specific milliliter because everything is in be, well, not everything, but liquids are going to be in milliliters. To calculate a drip rate, you need to know which administration set you're using. So again, the, either the 60 drip drop or the 15 drop per milliliter. Length of time for the infusion and the amount of flow. Desired dose is going to be the amount of medication physician orders you to administer. So again, that's based off of our protocols. We've already got a doctor that says these are the desired doses that I want you to administer. So we don't we don't have to call them every time we want to give something. Medication concentrations is going to be the total weight of medication contained within that specific uh, fluid or volume. And the weight per milliliter, weight per millimeter equals the total weight of medication divided by total volume in milliliters. Clear as mud? Yeah. Okay. Volume to be administered is the volume, volume equals the desired dose in milligrams divided by the concentration on hand. So your milligram per milliliter. Weight based medication dosages. Bases based on patients' weight in kilograms. So a lot of this, this it comes into a, a big factor when we're giving medications to pediatrics. Pediatrics, everything is basically weight balanced or weight based, right? Not everything in adults is weight based. We have a dosage range that we typically use. We have devices that can help us with the pediatric doses. We have the Braslow tape to help us with the approximate weight, which then will give us our dosages already made on a chart. It's awesome. And now the other thing that is out there is the hand heavy, which thanks to Amanda, we have charts and I think, almost, I think in our ambulances anyways. We have charts for, for based on the hand tipping. Calculations for pediatric drug dosing and medication infusions are the same as they are for adults. Just do it. Just do it. Just rip it. 
heavy at all or have you guys seen the hands heavy have you guys seen the hands heavy know anything about it max no okay never mind Andy. steps for administering specific routes say again muffled voice so do, have you used the hands heavy or have you seen the hands heavy So hand heavy is just another uh, way, uh, it's another resource for helping calculate pediatric dosages. Something that we've been looking at. Administering inter uh, enteral medications. So giving medications internally to the patient. Some way you're giving it either through the digestive system or the intestinal tract, so oral medications, Come in capsules, time-released capsules, lozenges, pills, tablets, elixirs, like the old Wild West, emulsions, suspensions, and syrups. These can either be done orally or rectally, or through a feeding tube. So. These all can either they can be done orally, rectally, or through a feeding tube. We actually had a patient who was, instead of drinking his alcohol, his vodka, he was injecting it into his his pig tube. Yeah, he didn't have the smell of alcohol. But there are also kids who are rectally introducing alcohol, so they don't have. So just keep that in mind, high schoolers. Hmm. Max. Okay. Oral medications, you may use small medicine cups. We well, I mean, know this kind of stuff. Medicine cups, medicine droppers, teaspoons, oral syringes. We need to make uh, keep standard precautions when we're helping administer some of these medications. So, what are we? What kind of medications are we administering orally for our patients? Uh, aspirin and nitro. and nitro, right? What else? Oh, oral glucose. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we need to make sure that we're using proper techniques for administering that. Make sure you're obtaining a good uh, medical history. And ensuring before you give any medication, ensuring that uh, you're verifying what drug allergies that that patient may have. Follow any standing orders, contact medical control for permission if you have to. Again, we have our standing, standing orders with our protocols. You want to check the medication, make sure it is the proper medication, make sure it is within date. Make sure that the patient is instructed on how to take that medication, like as a like, Oral glucose, the best, it's supposed to be buccal, right? So it should be in the cheek, right? They shouldn't just be taking that oral glucose and then just swallowing it. It's not the same, it's not gonna work. It's, they're getting it, but it's not gonna work as fast, it's not gonna work the same. Uh, nitro, where does nitro go? Right underneath the tongue, right? So ex instructing the patient on how to take that medication, and then aspirin. They should be kind of chewing that up, letting that dissolve in the mouth, and just kind of let that stay in the mouth, right? Getting that buccal absorption. And then make sure you document time and the patient's response. You're looking for that patient response. Obviously, we're not going to see a response with aspirin. But with nitro, again, you want to make sure the patient is educated on what side effects they might experience from that. But then you're looking for the end result, what, what positive effects that you're trying to achieve with those. Rectal administration of the keister. 
It says, uh, rectal administration of D50 is allowed. I've never thought about pushing D50 rectally. But we have, for pediatrics, we, we can go with like seizure medications rectally, right? So that's something that we would be able to push rectally. It is an option though, when no other route is available. <laughs> Perfect. Let's just. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. So things that ways of administering rectal medication, suppositories, which is a water soluble gel. Or no, you need to make sure you're using a water soluble gel uh, for lubrication before you insert that. I don't know that for any reason why any of us should be <laughs> inserting a suppository in any of our patients. But you know when the that's a better uh, No, it's not an ALS upgrade. This is uh, this is this is an advanced class. So this is at your level. <laughs> that's too <bad. laughs> <laughs> when medication is in liquid form, so again, when with pediatrics, we might give a seizure medication. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We might need to give this rectally, so we, and a way of doing it is using a nasal pharyngeal. <laughs> Making sure, you okay? Yeah. Making sure that it is looped up and so that it doesn't cause any damage. <laughs> Use a needle with syringe and gently push the medication through the tube. Make sure that the medication has been delivered and you just post on the tube. <laughs> this All right. Other GI track routes, subcutaneous, uh, other routes other than GI. So we're going to go with subcutaneous, we're going to go with IM, IV bolus, IO, sublingual, transcutaneous, transdermal, and inhalation. Puff, puff. IV administration is the most common parenteral drug routes. Obviously, we're looking at syringes, plungers, body of the barrel, body of barrels, the flange and the tip. Um, most syringes are marked with cal uh, calibrations per milliliter on one side of the barrel so that you can get uh, a good measurement. Three milliliter syringe is the most common use for injections. Needle lengths vary from three eighths of an inch to two inches for a standard injection. Packaging of medications comes in either ampules or vials for us or preloads. We have, the only thing that we, I think we have currently right now, we still have some ampules uh, with fentanyl and then the rest of that stuff is going to be either the vials or the preloads. Huh? Oh, that's right. Epi. Right. Right. Epi. Epi ampules. So with ampules, break the sterile glass container using, uh, is designed to carry a single dose of medication-ish. I mean, we have our ampules of epi is one milligram. That So that's going to be for that single patient, right? So it's but we could give that in multiple doses because our range varies whether it's for an adult or the pediatric. When you're breaking these uh, for protection, you need to, uh, it's suggested that you actually use a, like a four by four, two by two to help uh, protect yourself from broken glass. And then when you draw the medication out of these, you may make sure that you're using a filtration needle so that you're not drawing out glass and then pushing it into that patient's vein, which would be bad. 
Vials contain single or multiple doses, has a rubber stopper on top and made of glass or plastic on the outside. Pre-filled syringes are designed for ease of use. Also single dose disposable cartridges that use, that use a reusable syringe. Reconstitution is another way that's going to be, in, uh, for us it's in vials and our glucagon is in a, a reconstitution where so we take sterile water, push it into the powder, mixes it up and then we draw out that solution for injection. So this is I mean, good gun, probably right there. Two separate vials. And if you push, it'll mix, and then you can draw it out. Pre-filled syringes, tamper-proof boxes, except when they're in our, our medical bags and they break open because they get thrown around and smashed. And, right. Separated into glass medication cartridges and syringes, and then these have lines on them as well, so that you can deliver the proper uh, the proper dosage of that medication. Subcutaneous is going to be a smaller volume, smaller needle, and is introduced below the skin and above the muscle. Given to in volumes usually one milliliter or less, with 24, 20 gauge cap. Or, yeah, gauge needle. Common sites for subcutaneous are going to be abdomen, upper arm, anterior thigh. Make sure you're cleaning the site before you give it. I am injections directly into the muscle. This is done at a 90 degree angle to that muscle. So when you're doing this injection, truly, you, I mean, you cleanse the site. So if you're using the deltoid muscle, you clean, cleanse that site. If you pull traction so that you actually move the skin to where you're going to make that puncture, go at a 90 degree angle to the to the meat, push your fluids, and then let go. So if you pull traction on that skin, when you release traction, that skin should cover up where that hole was so you're not losing your fluid once you pull the needle out. Otherwise, if you just go just regular, push it straight in, you potentially are going to have some of that fluid still come out. So you're not getting a full dose of that. The patient's not getting a full dose. So it's something to consider. Uh, also with, let's see, so deltoid muscles, vastus lateralis muscle, rectus femoris, so the side of the leg, the front of the quad, are the two big muscles there, and then the gluteus maximus, so in the butt. Patients also have their own auto-injectors. Like for me, I have my own EpiPen. And EpiPen, typically, so you're going to be in that, I can do the top of the leg or side of the leg um, or, yeah, anaphylaxis. <coughs> when delivering medication also, I am, it is helpful for that patient. If Honestly, if you actually, it's actually helpful and get a faster, potentially a faster, Absorption if you start massaging that muscle where where you delivered that medication Sublingual Underneath the tongue we use the only thing we have right now we used to have the nitro spray But all we have now are the tablets Maybe we'll get some uh, Zofran tabs one of these days Huh? Well, yeah, but the sublingual. <clears throat> so I, I, I don't know Anything if you want to put. Else I don't know if you want to put the pace of. <laughs> so yeah, but we used to have a spray, a nitro spray that we would spray sublingual, as opposed to just giving the pills. Intranasal, we use that for different medications. Typically, it's going to be Narcan. So utilizing a uh, MAD device. And it helps atomize that medication so it can absorb into the vessels in the nose a little bit faster. And when you do nasal, so with the other, the other key with this nasal atomizer, so when you go IN, you should be going half dose in each side. So if you're going, if you're delivering 
one cc of fluid, whatever concentration of medication you're giving, if you're doing one cc, you should do half a cc in each side. Hmm? They, they use a nasal. And I think some of those, uh, they're already preloaded with a nasal atomizing, that mucosal atomizing device. Um, inhalers. With an inhaler, obviously we don't carry these. This is going to be a prescribed device. If you're assisting with a patient and using an inhaler, make sure you, well, one, make sure it's in the right dates, because sometimes I, I've come across those where they're like five years out of dates because they just never really use it. They kind of use it. Um, but it also needs to be shaken up before you give a squeeze and, and have them inhale. There's assisting devices for this, MDI devices that can help with a mouthpiece, especially for pediatrics, to help them help get that medication delivered. Uh, with this medication, with albuterol, make sure, and again, if it's somebody who hasn't really taken it, or it's, maybe it's their first time, again, an educational piece with this is gonna let them know that this can't amp you up. It's like giving you a little dose of adrenaline because it's, it could actually increase your heart rate. So expect, if somebody's taken two puffs of their inhaler, expect their heart rate to be elevated based off of that medication alone. Nebulized treatments, you might come across patients who actually do their own nebulized treatments in, in home. So a lot of times it's just gonna be albuterol that they nebulize, or they might have a, a pre-made pre concoction of, nebula, of albuterol and um, ibotropium. So they might have those already pre-filled. The nebulizer can be done in line with CPAP. So there, there's a benefit of that, especially when you have that patient that is in need of CPAP. IV medication is the route that we've been talking about at the beginning, directly into the, into the veins. There's actually some uh, needless systems to provide protection against needle sticks. One of the new needles uh, that we actually have in the system now to attach the syringe has a plastic, has plastic on one side and a, a metal uh, portion on the other side. So there's two different types of tips. Um, the needle, the metal side is less likely to puncture skin, but can be used through the rubber stops and through the needleless hubs. Um, so it's another safety device. They're still a little hard to push through the rubber stops of the vials, uh, but it is a safety device. And, and even with the plastic section of those needle tips, they actually have a, instead of having the hole at the very end to draw the medication out, it, when you're trying to get the medication out of the vial, the holes are on the sides so that uh, when you're trying to draw that medication out, you don't have to get that tip all the way down to the base of that rubber to try to draw that last little bit of medications out. IV medication, administration, Again, make sure you explain to the patient what you're doing. Don't just go up and just start doing an IV. Uh, just give them a, a shot in the arm because you're gonna freak them out. And you potentially could cause harm to them or even to yourself when that patient freaks out and you have an open sharp just flying around. Make sure that the equipment is the proper equipment. Make sure it's drawn up, uh, assembled in the proper way. Make sure that it's you're keeping everything clean. The medication is drawn appropriately, it's the right amount. If you have somebody drop your medication, say they drop epi out of an ampule, and you only want to give 0.3 milligrams, yet they drew that whole amount of one milligram, 
make sure you know that before you go and administer that epi and you go in and push epi into that that muscle and you're not pushing a full one milligram make sure it's the, the right dose that you're pushing uh, different people have different ways of drawing medications I like drawing the entire thing out and only pushing what I what I need because then I don't have to go and draw up that medication a second time but the problem with that is if I make a mistake or I hand it to somebody that doesn't know that I've drawn up all that medication you could cause harm to that patient the other thing with epi that out of that ampule is it's one to one thousand if you're going to draw that up and give that to a patient that should be going I am right because of that concentration if you go the wrong route and that medication goes IV you're potentially going to cause harm and put that patient into some type of cardiac dysrhythmia they're going to have sudden ch chest pain when all they had before was a little breathing difficulty and some hives now they got chest pain on top of that I've seen that once since I've been here and if stuff happens stuff stuff happens okay mistakes happen and if you do make a mistake on medication route dosage make sure you let the doctors know because again mistakes happen but you have to make sure you own up to it uh, talk to the doc make sure the doc knows hey I made a mistake I did it this way I I know I shouldn't have it should have been this way I went IV with the epi instead of I am they've got chest pain now no surprise but let's make sure that they know and then you've got to make sure that you document that information um, Uh, if you're going I am with medication you're supposed to once you push the needle into the muscle you're supposed to draw back a little bit with the plunger just to make sure that you're not getting a blood return you shouldn't get any return with that if you get a blood return then you're probably in some type of a vessel so now it's going to be administered a little bit differently than just metabolized to the muscle make sure that the port is clean insert the needle with the syringe flush place the needle in the sharp container IO medication make sure so the other thing too here's another point so with medication if you're going to de be delivering any medication through an IV line through a needleless port through just a lock lure lock you should be cleaning that port with an alcohol prep before you administer that medication especially if you're picking up this patient or this this patient has had some time frame in between that IV line being placed and the time medication is being pushed through that IV because if any bacteria or anything gets onto the lure lock on that on that hub of that extension set now if you don't clean it you're pushing that stuff into the veins which would be bad could cause a systemic reaction so think of it just remember that try to keep things clean um, any other questions no sweet online Ryan Andy you guys still awake Taylor <laughs> You guys are awesome. I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody staying awake, at least here. If you're at home and you fell asleep, it's all right.